In life's journey, we must seek to reflect, learn, and grow. Welcome to the Road to Rediscovery with your host, Aubrey Johnson. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of The Road to Rediscovery. I'm your host, Aubrey Johnson. The Road to Rediscovery is about reflecting on life lessons to learn and grow and to reach out and help others who are struggling through dark times. You know, we all wear various hats throughout life, right? We're parents, employees, spouses, partners, uncles, aunts, and a lot more. But in all these hats or roles, where does our true identity lie? Here's what I mean. What is, what is it that is at the core of our character, of who we are, that equips us to navigate throughout each of our roles, but not be defined by them? My special guest has realized how the societal ex- expectations of men have prevented them from being their true selves and cultivate deep and engaging relationships. Through his journey, he's redirected his course for a journey of self-discovery, harnessing the power and strength of vulnerability. He's a mindset and transformational coach who helps men level up success, fulfillment, and relationships. Get ready for an engaging conversation and let's welcome Jay Williams to the show. Hello, Jay. Man, it's so great to have you here. Hey, Aubrey. Thanks for that intro. Uh, Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to this one. Fantastic. Yeah, man. Uh, and, and, and I'm equally excited. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, chat with us here. So Jay, uh, if you don't mind, I want to turn back the clock to like, let's say your formative years. And uh, can you tell us what was your first example of how a man should be and from whom? Yeah, sure. It's a, that's a great question, actually. So for me personally, my kind of experience of men really started as for so many it is um, when I was a young boy and Mm -hmm. this really started for me at the age of three when my parents got divorced Mm. my parents got divorced um, my mum was uh, went off with another man and I got to see different modeling for what men can be like how they can behave Mm -hmm. And for me personally, this was um, my dad, my dad, who was the type of guy who was very, let's say, manly. He was the type (laughs) of guy who was very hard up. He didn't show emotion. He uh, wasn't the type of guy who expressed vulnerability, but instead often expressed certain emotions such as anger and um maybe some other emotions around uh, being hurt, but not actually expressing it in that way and owning up to the fact that he was actually hurt. And this was off the back of my parents' divorce. And I can't say I actually recall the vivid detail of it, but I can certainly recall the aftermath and my experience of uh, my father uh, as I grew up in the way he handled emotion. Gotcha, gotcha. So would uh, would that pretty much from a um from a consequence uh result in uh we model the behaviors um that is our most significant example right as we grow up so um would that be say a path that 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 you kind of you kind of took initially uh in your let's say teenage years early adulthood yeah sure i mean it's so easy to actually mimic and model other people. And that's what we all typically do in the beginning, right? Because we don't know anything else. So for me personally, I decided I was going to model what my dad did, right? Because one thing I didn't share is after my parents breakup, there was, there was huge turmoil in my life. It was massively traumatic for me as an experience. I Mm -hmm. felt abandoned. I felt like, um, my parents didn't love me and I made it all about me being an egocentric child, even though it wasn't about me. That's what I made it mean. And I was desperate to become somebody who could get my dad's approval. And so the way I leaned into that was that I started to uh, pretend to be someone I wasn't. I started to put on these 
different ways of being these masks, you might say, to actually um, try and get the approval of other people and my father in order to actually uh, get his actual love. Man, you know, <laughs> Uh, and I, and I kind of swallow when, when I, when, when you say that, man, because uh, I can relate all too well, um, trying to get the approval and the appreciation from, from my father growing up. Um, <clears throat> and my father, father was a military man and uh, a career military man. And, and so was my mother, but, um, you know, um, trying to just get him to recognize you know, that, hey, I'm a, I'm a very capable person, I can, you know, I can do things and, and I can achieve things. And uh, it, it was, it, it, it was, it was tough. And so I, I kind of, I guess, protected that vulnerable feeling of needing attention by trying to get attention outside of the home, as well as, you know, with my father. So, uh, yeah, man, I can, I can relate all too well. So you, you mentioned masks and, um, I, I guess, I don't know, a mask can be like a double sword, right? Um, uh, it, it, it can, it can equip you for whatever role you have to do in that present time, I guess. Uh, but at the same time, it can be a slippery slope in, in causing one to lose their identity if they get too immersed in it is, is, is my, is my thought, I guess. So, um, you, you did serve in the military, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I did nine years in the Air Force. Nine years. Okay. So, so, um, can, can you just, just give us, paint a picture for us as far as what, um, and how this, um, the, the type of mask that you wore for that time in that role has, has helped you, but at the same time hurt you. Yeah, sure. I think it's probably important to give people a little more context around the mask because we talk about masks and people are like, am I wearing a mask? And, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm mm -hmm. not always going to be the same person with my my intimate partner as I am with my mum and dad and vice versa with my friends. And so I think it's important to give a bit of context to the mask. Oh, yeah. So what happened for me personally was when when my parents got divorced at the age of three, I added lots of meaning to what was happening. I talked about being an egocentric child, which we all are up until about the age of six years of age. And I made it about me. I made it mean that it was my fault. And there were certain decisions that I made about myself, which led to me having certain beliefs about who I was, what people thought about me, how I needed to behave. And one of those decisions I made was that who I am is not lovable, who I am is not good enough who I am is broken mm -hmm. and so what naturally happens here is we create a, a split in our our self our personality we create a separate self and for me this separate self this version often looked like trying to get the approval of other people and I did this in many different ways and this showed up in different scenarios where I was playing different roles and it showed up for example in my intimate relationship I would be the nice guy she'd say jump and I'd say how high with my parents I would be uh, the favorite son I'd do anything for them with my friends I was often the loudest person in the room I liked being the center of attention I loved being the one who was the loudest and uh, if there was a party, I was the one that was typically involved in that. And then when I was in the Air Force, it was this kind of um, more macho, laddish role that I was actually playing. Now, I talk about masks and I would never say to anyone, OK, you're being inauthentic if you're behaving differently with, with your intimate partner versus being around your friends. Right. And so to give you the distinction around masks, it's only really a mask when you're trying to be something you're not out of a place of insecurity mm, gotcha. where you don't feel like you can bring and present that true authentic self, but you are expressing that divided self, the part that you think people want to see in order to love you, give you approval, give you attention, whatever it is, is the need that you're trying to fulfill. And so when I was in the air force, this would show up in, um, this very rebellious <laughs> character, this person that 
didn't exactly toe the line. Mm-hmm. I always went against the grain mm-hmm. and I always challenged things, but I would still get people on side, get people to like me. So they would support my viewpoint and I would get their approval and they would like me. And the, the plus side of this is that I was quite popular. But then there was this downside to it that was actually crippling inside. See, inside, I lived in fear that I was constantly going to be found out. I felt anxious. I felt empty. Mm -hmm. And so while I was trying to keep up this uh, inauthentic version of me to try and get the approval, to try and get my way, try and navigate my way through this world, there was this other side of me that just felt this complete disconnect from what was showing up in my life and so that presented massive challenges it was hard work trying to be someone different all of the time it was exhausting trying to keep it up trying to keep (laughs) the act it's a bit like keeping up a lie try and keep up a lie for an extended period of time multiple different scenarios multiple different people it will be hard work and eventually you'll get found out and I just lived in constant fear that I was going to get found out wow man you know um yeah, that can be very exhausting, very draining. And, 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 and so, you know, regarding those times, like uh, during those times as a young man being, you know, the quote tough guy or say the life of the party, you know, you got people to like you, but in the midst of, of, of this inauthentic version of yourself, uh, you know, and, and you mentioned, you know, there were times when, when you would, have I guess for lack of a better term a little bit of maybe even anxiety or worry that you'd get found out and that sort of thing so um, when would these feelings of loneliness doubt and vulnerability start to surface Um, uh, it wasn't obviously during the parties and like the pub gatherings right no it wasn't no normally it was the morning after when I think uh, what what have I done okay Uh, what have I said and I found myself already to be super analytical over my behavior. Mm -hmm. And there was this, if I, if I like say exaggerated something a little more than what was actually the truth, then I would get this crushing anxiousness uh, and this fear. There's a fear really was what's called toxic shame. It Mm -hmm. was the fear of being found out that there was something wrong with me. There was something broken and was toxic shame. Mm -hmm. And, If I would have got found out, then I would have experienced that massive shame. But it didn't mean that I didn't feel it anyway. And so I remember I remember when I used to go to a meeting and you'd have a meeting and they'd say, hey, has anyone got any questions? And I would hate asking questions. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask questions, but I I felt conflicted because I was worried that if I asked the question and then people laughed at me or I looked stupid, I would experience this deep shame within me. So I just didn't ask questions. So while in some instances, I was the life and soul of the party in certain contexts, to a degree, I felt, I think, somewhat safe there. Mm, But it was only the aftermath of it. So I love my comfort zone, (laughs) believe it or not. (laughs) You, You might say someone in the military might not like her comfort zone, but I certainly love my comfort zone. I knew what I was good at. And that's the way I navigated it. And so I focused on my strengths, like we all tend to do. Mm-hmm. And um, it's only when I was put out of side of my comfort zone that these feelings were just like amplified massively. Gotcha. So were, were there any, um, was there any degree of anonymity that, um, that, that played a part during this time? I'm not one for big words. Aubrey, and I can't oh, even pronounce that word. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anonymity, um, the security of not being known. I mean, you were known because you had to make yourself physically and visibly present, um, you know, in parties and pub gatherings and, and you know, just different activities with, with people and interacting, uh, you know, socially. But um, anonymity being the security behind I guess you could say a mask or behind of, of, of not, you know, being known or revealed um, was, was anonymity a part of, of, of this that you were going through, I guess is what I'm asking. 
was animating a part of what I was going through. See, this is the, I, I want to just express something because this is like a great point, Aubrey. If you'd have asked me this question and I wouldn't have understood it, I'd have just sat here and tried to blag my way through it. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I would have. <laughs> and and, uh-huh. and then what would have happened is afterwards, I'd have watched the same, listened to the same clip 20 times over and then been like, Oh, I must, I'm going to get found out. I'm going to make a massive idiot of myself. And what if someone I know hears this or what are people thinking about me? I really don't understand what, what you're asking me. (laughs) (laughs) But but, but you're, you're, it's your, it's your, your willingness now to be vulnerable and, and, and say that though, that, that very statement you just said, right? Exactly. And I wanted to express that, that I don't know that the old me would have been like, really you cannot say that you cannot say that people will see that you don't know what this word means or don't know what he's saying and then I might upset Uh, you Aubrey and what uh, if it ruins the show and so this is just a great example of uh, how when you come to a place of true authenticity then you can just express that and there's no meaning behind it it's just hey I don't know and that's the truth wow man you know what (laughs) <laughs> that is a great example. And and trust me, none of this is scripted. So it's not <laughs> like we were trying to go down this path to show the listeners how you would have been on a question versus how you are now. Um, it, it just came organically. So I appreciate that vulnerability, Jay. I really, really do. Another thing I appreciate is um, the distinction that you've made between masks and um, you know, when someone wears a hat or plays a role, um, that distinction for the benefit of the, of the listeners um, must be very clear. And you were crystal clear in explaining that distinction of, of, you know, someone who wears a hat or a role, it's the behavior that they need to have or uh, to support that role at that present time. Uh, it, it's not hiding from their identity or, uh, or, or, or trying to hide a a vulnerability, whereas a mask um, is more in that protective state and is more in that guarded state, um, and and so forth. So, uh, so I appreciate that that clarification, man. So, um, I just it, want to build on that, Aubrey. If, sure, if you like, absolutely. So, what people don't often realize when they think about personality, they think, "Hey, like this is who I am. This is what I do." Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't actually realize that we have a split everyone has a split personality Mm. see we have sub personalities and when we are showing up in these different roles let's say with mom or dad or partner or with our friends we're Mm. just expressing a different side to our personality it's not necessarily inauthentic when you actually show up in this way Mm. you're just showing the part of you that is necessary to meet the need of that situation. And so we see this in our work. I see it in business where I might need to be the guy who's taking charge and leading my team Mm -hmm. versus the guy who just wants to sit back and play and have fun. (laughs) So (laughs) it's not that any of it is inauthentic when we're talking about not wearing the mask when we're in these roles, Right. It's just we're showing people a different shade to our personality. And I think it's important that people get that because mm-hmm. so many times people, there can be a lot of confusion. Like, but I'm different people. And like, is this right? Is this wrong? And I'd, I'd really encourage you to not make it right or wrong. It's just you doing you in different situations. I think it's important that people understand that. 100%. 100%. I, I, I totally agree. So Jay, let's talk about that defining time or event. Um, was there a defining time or event that uh, that occurred where you drew the line in the sand and took that hard look in the mirror and said, you know what, I need to go on a crusade of self-discovery. I, I need to figure out who I really am and um, understand the permission to feel. I mean, what was that transformational moment or event if if there was one yeah i mean the truth is it wasn't like i was going on a journey of discovering how i feel who i was as a man or Mm -hmm. vulnerability or any of the stuff that we talk about these idea of mass 
I, I joined the military when I was 19. When I joined the military, I was excited. I was off on this adventure. I thought, well, hey, I can get away from my small uh, country village that I grew up in in North Wales here in the UK. And I thought, yeah, adventure. I can learn things. I can go and uh, learn a craft and you know help people with that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I moved away. Um, moved away from Wales and I I joined the Air Force and I I started to train as an IT and telecommunications uh, technician. Mm -hmm. And my first posting that I got, I was out there um, driving about in Range Rovers, going and fixing people's equipment. I was learning. It it was amazing. And quite often I would just walk into the office and I'd push the button, (laughs) power off, (laughs) I power (laughs) on and fix the issue. Uh Uh, But I absolutely loved it. And what I loved about it is the freedom the, the learning, the, the helping people, seeing people really happy. And I reached a point um, in my career, probably about the seven year mark, and I've done various roles after that, mm-hmm. where the military had contracted out a lot of the, the really good work. And there was a number of roles that were left, which weren't so good. And one of those involved sitting in an office for about 12 hours on a 12 hour mm-hmm. shift, mm-hmm. where I'd probably get four phone calls in the night. And one of them would probably be a missed call. <laughs> or a wrong number oh, wow. and I was bored I was unfulfilled I felt trapped I'd stopped learning I'd stopped growing I wasn't really helping anyone and I absolutely just hated it mm. but then in stark contrast in the evening I was either a bedroom DJ or I was out playing in a club and what I loved about that is I always said that I was a born entertainer. <laughs> I <laughs> love being in front of people. Uh-huh. And what I really loved, Aubrey, is that at the push of a button, it didn't matter what was going on in people's lives. Mm. In that moment, I could mm-hmm. completely transform their world. And it just made me feel so alive. And I had this massive contrast in my life. And I went on a holiday to Ibiza and I, I came back and I was just like, is this all there is? Like, is this what I really want? Mm. And so I made the decision that I was going to leave the Air Force and I was going to go to Ibiza and go and become a professional DJ <laughs> <I'm in Ibiza laughs> and live the high life. And, yeah, you know, like most plans, they don't go according to plan. I, mm. I met a girl. I, I fell in love with her. And at the same time, I got presented with a business opportunity, start mm. my very first online business. And, I was looking at it, I was thinking, wow, I can go and help people. I can travel the world. I can DJ. I can build this online business. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Yeah. Because everybody I was seeing out there was crushing it, apparently. Mm. They had the private jets, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lamborghinis or the yeah. Ferraris. It was right. so easy. And I was telling everybody, I'm going to be a millionaire in a year. Just you watch this space because everybody was telling me how how much opportunity uh, there was in the online space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and as I battled through um, my challenges in business, I kept on coming up against the wall. And I realized that business is not that easy. And you're going to have to become someone you've never been before. You're going to have to do and be something you've never been before in order to create the level of success and the results that you really want in your life and as I came up against this walls I would build a business and it would do really well but then we'd feel empty and then I'd be like I'm bored now so I'd go to the next one and I'd build that up like it had a multiple six-figure e-commerce store and I was Mm. like I'm bored of this Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I started I kept on hitting these glass ceilings and I was like why is it that I get bored why is it I change why is it I become what traditionally you might say successful and then change And so I decided I was going to go on this discovery of what is it that's holding me back? What's stopping me from truly fulfilling my potential? And I think it was only after I'd gone through a period of time where I started to uh, learn about myself, learn what I was good at, what I liked, what I didn't like, that I really made the decision to go on this deep dive into transformation that followed in the next kind of four or five years. I see. I see. Wow. So <clears throat> in this deep dive, um, what were some of the findings, um, you know, that, that or, or revelations, I guess, that you had? Yeah, great question. 
honestly, I had no idea how the human mind worked. <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I had no idea why I did the things I did. Mm -hmm. Because no one had taught me anything about the human mind, human behavior, human psychology, how to have a relationship, how to handle money, right. how to build a business. No one had taught me any of that. And for me, some of the biggest things I learned was that there are things that happen in our lives. And in those moments, especially highly emotive events, we often make decisions. We make decisions about who we are. We make decisions about how life is. Right. And what happens, we put on a pair of glasses and we call that our lens in which we see the world. And then that lens in which we see the world shapes how we see the world. It shapes our behavior. It shapes how we engage and respond to the world. Mm -hmm. And it's ultimately the very same thing that actually limits us. We create something called limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beliefs that are made from limited information that we have available to us at any one time. I see. And until we actually challenge these beliefs, until we actually shift our perspective with new information, mm -hmm. then we cannot create the things we want. And so gotcha. understanding that we all have beliefs about the world, understanding that events of our past, even though it doesn't feel like it's an issue anymore as an adult, it feels like it's in the past, so it can't be true, those events are actually shaping our behavior in the now. Mm. Because as I always say, that if you break your left leg, yes, if you break your left leg, if you hurt your left leg, you always compensate by leaning on the right. Right. Because it's too painful to lean on the, on the left leg. And I give the example before, when my parents broke up, what I made it mean is there's something wrong with me. I'm broken. I'm unlovable. I'm not good enough. So if my way of being was not good enough in the way that I was, I wasn't accepted, then what I was going to, what was I going to do? I was going to compensate. So I come up with these masks, these behaviors, which got me the things that I wanted and they worked, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it was really understanding that our past is never just our past. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. That's probably one of the biggest distinctions I learned. Well, that's a huge distinction. And, 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 you know, that, that kind of touches on my next question um, regarding the past, right? Um, let's use, for instance, the societal expectations of men, right? Um, in my view, has been fashioned from generations going way back, right? Um, fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers, and so forth. Um, you know, and primarily, I guess the one, the, the consistent roles in, in the expectation of a man has been protector, provider, leader. Um, you know, in my view, it doesn't seem like it's really changed, in, you know, from our past generations. But um, in terms of the direction that, uh, that, that, you know, men are going now, you know, where uh, I guess it's still having these roles, playing these roles, but also understanding, you know, um, um, I don't know, kind of debunking the uh, the notion from past generations that men are tough, they don't express their feelings, um, you know, they can't be sensitive and that sort of thing. But a lot of men are starting to realize, yes, I can be vulnerable. Yes, I can, you know, uh, be sensitive and so forth, um, you know, when the time is right and so forth. So, um, in, 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 in that, in, in that, uh, lens, I guess you can say, do you think, do you think the men's role is being redefined or is it just the narrative that, that should be changed in this scenario? Yeah, I think the, there's a number of things at play here and it's easy to say, okay, it's, it's this one thing and I don't know all men, so I can only give my opinion <laughs> Right, right. And, and people will have their own opinions on it. I think for, for me personally, I do think things are changing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's this whole, this whole notion 
that men are uh, the victims or men are in a place of crisis right now. Mm-hmm. And that's come from women, like equal opportunities, equal rights, women actually really taking a stand and more empowered women come into, into the world. And the roles in our societies are actually change, I believe. For example, there are so many more uh, stay-at-home dads now. Now, that mm-hmm. wouldn't have been a thing before. Right. But right. now uh, women are sometimes the breadwinners. Now, for a lot of guys, that, that isn't so easy to take. <laughs> <laughs> and trust me when I say I, I've had experience of my partner earning a lot more money from me than, mm-hmm. than me when I started my business and having to rely on her like that really hurt my ego. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah. I think that things are changing in our world. And I don't honestly believe men are in crisis. I think that we are not victims of anything. (laughs) We are responsible for the change we really want to see in the world. And so I think in terms of the narrative that you were talking about, about men shouldn't cry, men should be tough. I think that while it is something that is shifting and men are being encouraged to be more vulnerable, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's substantive and when i when i say that we still live in a world where there's very much a lad culture in certain uh, spaces so i always give the example of like if you think about builders Mm -hmm. construction Mm -hmm. that world has very little space for men to be soft or even the military in so many respects yeah yeah and so to open up yourself to open up your heart to other men is really challenging. And I'm a facilitator of men's groups. Yes. And one of the things I see is that men often, as long as they haven't had too many traumatic experiences with women, will actually can find in women more than they will other men. Hmm. So I find that men tend to trust women more than they trust other men. So if you're in those cultures of whether it be the military or construction or whatever the workspace you're in, there's not really that much space for you to actually be yourself, be vulnerable because (laughs) so much of it is rife with tearing each other down. It's often seen that that's a healthy way to have a male relationship. Now there is a slight distinction to it. I think in that, I honestly believe banter. We call it banter in the UK. I don't know what you guys call it. (laughs) (laughs) Having that jokey nature, you know, we call it a little bit taking the pee a little bit. It is important to men, but it's only, um, only valuable when it's not there and you're not just constantly victimizing one particular individual for the way they look or the way they are. Right. And so, there's loads of stuff in this question and it's just (laughs) (laughs) just getting my head around it but really we have different sectors of society where it's very difficult for men to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. i do believe the younger generation in particular are being more open to being vulnerable because that's the world they've been brought up in right Uh, right. but i still think that as it relates to men to men then it's still a massive challenge because i think on some level there is this deep rooted programming that we have, which is um, other, another man is a threat. Right. And yeah. so I think that's where we have the, the trust thing. Because physically, physically, he might be. Whereas a woman, it's no disrespect to a woman, I'm sure a woman could harm a man in her own way. Mm-hmm. And another man, physically, he, ha- he has the strength quite often to be able to hurt another man. Mm-hmm. And so I, I find that relationship very interesting in that men struggle to trust other men well that's certainly been my experience wow that's yeah that's that's interesting and 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 kind of kind of surprising actually um and 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 men trusting other men is it is it in a in a, in a different context than let's say the military when you know uh, in 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 the throes of war or in the throes of 
um, just, uh, you know, being in a dangerous situation, you know, your brothers in arms where you have, uh, you have, uh, you have to watch each other's back, right? There's a level of trust that's involved there yeah. versus say um, an emotional type of trust in terms of trusting a man, trusting another man when being vulnerable or sensitive to, you know, to them in a, in a, in a, you know, in an appropriate setting, trusting that that other man will receive that. I mean, um, w- what context is that trust that men uh, kind of gravitate more towards women than other men? Yeah, I'm glad you made that distinction because sure, you need to trust a brother, you need to trust another man in that kind of hostile situation. Of course you do. And there is elements of trust. You might trust that people can do a certain job. Right. I'm really referring to this emotional component gotcha. where men open up themselves and open up parts of themselves, which would, they wouldn't normally open up mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to other men. Gotcha. One of the biggest things I hear men say is that when they come to something like a men's group, I just don't have this with my friends and I can't talk to my friends. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that that's one of the biggest thing. And For many of them, they've known these friends all of their life, Mm -hmm. but still they can't talk to them. So they come to something like a men's group so they can uh, open up. And it is one of the most refreshing places for men to come because I think that the biggest fear, this is what I believe, I think the biggest fear is that if men are to open up, then they will be judged. Judged or bantered. (laughs) <laughs> you know judged yeah judged, yeah yeah i mean i mean I, I i'm in lockstep with you jay i can i can totally understand because i have friends that i've grown up since childhood you know and very close to we've done a lot of activities together um that you know i don't i don't quite feel comfortable about revealing how i feel deep feelings about something or or hurt you know, um, uh, and, and, and there's even some coworkers that, you know, I'm, that, that I'm in the same boat with. However, I am a part of a men's group, uh, a men's group that takes part in a devotional every morning. And uh, I, I tell you, I can't think of a better way to frame my mindset to, to, uh, to take on the day, you know, than attending this uh, men's group every morning it's nourishing it's fulfilling uh, it's refreshing you know and uh, and 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 these guys I haven't known all my life you know um, but you know th- we have that safe space we can express and still be men you know and and and, and I think um, you know we don't want to be a subject of ridicule we don't want to be judged and, uh, and, 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 and that's, that's the fear that we have in revealing to our friends, you know, who we are, um, uh, that we've spent, you know, most of our lives with that, you know, we may not be able to have that conversation. So, yeah. I, yeah. I, and I was going to say, Aubrey, as well, that mm-hmm. it can, it is possible. It's certainly possible. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. And the, here's the irony of it in order to actually have that with your friends, mm-hmm. you're going to have to be vulnerable with them. As in... <laughs> the, the, right. The, the, Chicken the, or the egg, right? You have to take <laughs> that step. <laughs> and and it, with, I did this with my friends. Mm-hmm. I, and I, I said to them, hey guys, you know, I, I'm not prepared to have this type of relationship anymore where it's just surface. I want to talk to you about the deep stuff that I'm really experiencing, what's really going through my mind that I'm hurting in this area. Mm. And Mm. it took going there in that way to actually start to open up those types of conversations. And what I've always found, this is like in every, pretty much every conversation I've had, when I'm willing to be vulnerable Mm-hmm. and take the lead and take that big risk mm-hmm. many men know how tough that is and so i think there's this component of respect mm-hmm. and what tends to happen organically is other men then respond because it's almost like you give them permission to open yes. up yes 100 percent, 100 percent. and you know um we, we talk about the men's 
view and the lens when it comes to this type of shift, right? And so uh, I, I want to I want to know, you know, uh, and for the listeners to know, in in your work and experience in facilitating these men's groups and workshops, right? Um, this men's shift that we're talking about, um, have you heard from any of uh, the men that you work with or, you know, how, how is how is this shift uh, impacted or, or been received by, let's say, their significant others, their children, maybe other family members? Um, how, how has it been received by them? Is it something visible? I mean, I'm sure the, the man doesn't make a proclamation coming home to his family saying, you know what, everyone? Now I am changed. I am going to be more sensitive and express my feelings, and I'm going to be sensitive to your feelings. You know, but 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 how has it been received when a man makes that shift by their family members and significant others? It's huge. Mm. I, I mean, I work with one particular client of mine, and um, I'm good friends with his partner as well. And she turned around to me and said, "I don't know what the hell you've been doing with my partner, mm. but keep doing it." <laughs> <laughs> nice man oh that is great and um we work on many different things yeah um, but i do see the impact not just on partners but on children as well in the family because again it really comes back to what i was talking about earlier on mm -hmm. nobody taught us any of this stuff no like I, no. guys come to me and they've often got challenges in their business, right? They know something's getting in the way, but yeah. quite often it's not just an issue that they're experiencing in their business. It often influences and impacts their relationships as well. Yes. And that the two areas, I honestly believe people experience the biggest source of pain and they really get to know themselves if mm -hmm. they're willing to be aware of it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. their relationship and their business. Gotcha. Gotcha. All of the pain will mm -hmm. show up in those two areas, 100%. Mm, yeah, I have no doubt of that. I mean, because there's pain in both. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, man, Jay, this is awesome, man. So, so how can the listeners learn more about you and the great work that you're doing in helping men connect in a deeper, more meaningful level? Yeah, so if you want to find out more about me, you can go to jwilliamscoaching.com. You can find out more about the work I do there. If you want to digest some more of this content, we cover some really great topics on the Masterless Men podcast. We are taking a break right now, but we've talked about everything from uh, vulnerability to porn to um, <laughs> erotic <laughs> blueprints in the bedroom to love languages to useful and valuable tools which you can apply to your life. So go and check out the Masterless Men podcast, where you can uh, find out a little bit more and uh, digest some more of this, uh, this type of conversation. Wonderful. Well. Oh, wonderful. All right. So jwilliamscoaching.com and the Maskless Men podcast. We're going to make sure and have direct links to both of those in our episode show notes for our listeners benefit. Jay, man, thank you so much for such a great conversation, man. I've really, really enjoyed this for sure. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Aubrey. It's, uh, it's been fun. Oh, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more, man. So now we're going into a segment I like to call Three for the Road. And in Three for the Road, that's where I ask my guests three random yet thought-provoking questions, uh, kind of inspiring or encouraging them to answer in five words or less. So what do you say, Jay? You think you're up for it? <laughs> I don't think I've ever done anything in five words or less <laughs> in five minutes or less <laughs> yeah well, likewise same here <laughs> same here for sure all right cool well in three for the road man um you know these are not cookie cutter questions I don't ask the same questions for every guest okay these questions are customized for my guests based off their journey their expertise and the work that they do okay so uh all right <laughs> Three for the road. Here we go, Jay. Starting with number one. Can you give me a meaning? Well, not can you, but give me a meaningful and thoughtful statement that you wouldn't expect one man to say to another at a pub. Oh. 
I'm scared, mate. <laughs> I'm scared, mate. Okay, okay. I like that. I like that. Awesome. Number two, name a less than manly activity that a group of men can do together and really connect. Name a less than manly activity that a group of men can do together and connect. (laughs) attend a men's group (laughs) (laughs) okay attend a men's group you got it man all right cool cool okay so number three topping us off for three for the road jay with the knowledge you have now if you can go back two generations and speak to a group of men from that time, what would you tell them? Wow, what a question. Does that count as three words? Two words. No. <laughs> what you do today will shape the next hundred years all right all right very i'm gonna add more I'm going to add add more. No, that's okay. (laughs) If my words are out the window. (laughs) Well, no, you can, you you can, okay, go ahead. uh, What you do today is going to shape the next hundred years of how boys are raised and how women perceive men. Mm, Nice. Nice. Uh, Very profound and very meaningful uh, for sure. So it's, it's worth, it's worth the overage of five words. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, fantastic. Jay, man, this has been a great conversation, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And please, I I genuinely say this and mean this when I say, let's stay connected. Okay. I would love to have you on the show, maybe six to eight months down the line to where we can, you know, just give the listeners an update on what's going on in Jay Williams's life. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Oh, great. Let's stay connected. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We're, we, we definitely will. We definitely will. And a big thanks to all of you for tuning in and listening. And a quick reminder that the Road Warrior channel is now available in op- Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to the channel and it locks or unlocks. <laughs> it unlocks new weekly episodes that are ad free. There are two bonus episodes each month and other bonus content such as pre and post recording conversations and archived interviews going as far back as 2008. Try it free for seven days on Apple Podcasts. Also, and most importantly, do you know someone who is struggling through despair, self-doubt, and seems to be at the end of their rope with nowhere to run, no direction? If so, then I humbly ask you that you please share this show with them. Because on the road to rediscovery, there are two things we want our listeners to know. Number one, you're not alone. And number two, there is always, always hope. The road to rediscovery, it's a movement, a revolution. And guess what? You are now part of it. We're all roadies on this journey of life. And it sure feels good having you on the road with me. Thanks again for listening. We'll chat again soon. The Road to Rediscovery is an AJ Shark production.